Hello everyone. Today I'll be providing an introductory overview of shock, focusing on its diagnosis and classification. By the end of this video, you should be able to define shock, be able to recognize a patient experiencing shock, and be able to list its four major types. I'll start by asking, what exactly is shock? That's a common word that's used all the time by healthcare professionals and laypeople alike. In everyday usage, it's often used to describe states of sudden emotional distress. And in TV and movies, sometimes characters will use the word shock as an imprecise synonym for hypothermia. But in medicine, the word shock should be reserved for this, a physiologic state characterized by systemic impairment in oxygen delivery as a result of reduced tissue perfusion, almost universally mediated by low blood pressure. How can one recognize a patient in shock? First, it's critical to realize that there is no one single exam or lab finding that's adequately sensitive or specific for shock to be considered a gold standard. Instead, a diagnosis of shock should be made based on an overall impression using a wide array of physical findings and lab abnormalities. One of the most common findings, of course, is low blood pressure. But as we'll see at the end of the next video in this series, not all patients with shock are hypotensive, and not all hypotensive patients have shock. Let's go through the rest of the findings head to toe. Starting with the neurologic system, Patients frequently have some form of altered mental status. There's a pattern starting initially from agitation, which progresses to delirium, and eventually, if the shock is not successfully treated quickly, becomes somnolence and coma. Not everyone goes through this progression in a clear fashion. Some will start off delirious or somnolent. However, always consider emerging shock on the differential diagnosis of the newly agitated patient. In the respiratory system, almost all patients with shock have tachypnea, and many also have hypoxemia. This can be due to cardiogenic pulmonary edema, for example, in shock complicating a massive heart attack. It can also be due to non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, such as ARDS complicating sepsis. In the cardiovascular system, a nearly universal finding is tachycardia. If you encounter a patient who's in shock, but not tachycardic, there must be an explanation for that. Excessive beta blocker activity or a primary arrhythmogenic disease such as sick sinus syndrome. Anyone with a normal heart will become tachycardic in shock. An elevated troponin is also not uncommon. If the elevation is dramatic, it suggests an MI may be the underlying culprit. But if the elevation is very modest, what some people might call a quote troponin leak, may be simply a manifestation of globally decreased coronary perfusion secondary to low diastolic blood pressure. Affecting the liver, patients can develop a mildly elevated bilirubin, either from reduced blood flow to the liver or from passive hepatic congestion from a failing heart. When poor blood delivery is the primary problem, patients can also develop elevated transaminases. When the AST and ALT rise over a thousand from hypoperfusion, it's frequently referred to as shock liver. Amazingly, most patients' hepatic function will fully recover over days to weeks once normal perfusion is restored. Poor perfusion in the kidneys will immediately result in decreased urine output, followed shortly thereafter by a rise in serum creatinine. And with the extremities, they can be unusually cold, can display peripheral cyanosis, and patients will have weak peripheral pulses which is a sign of low pulse pressure if a blood pressure cuff is not immediately available. These don't map to a specific region of the body, but more systemic abnormalities include either high or low platelet counts, as well as an elevated INR that can progress to disseminated intravascular coagulation, particularly in septic shock. Lastly, the most important finding of impaired tissue perfusion in shock is an elevated lactate level which is frequently, though not always, associated with decreased serum bicarbonate. Once the presence of shock has been identified, in order to prescribe appropriate treatment, one needs to determine what shock subtype the patient is experiencing, as different subtypes have markedly different treatment approaches. 
And to understand the different shock types, we must first very briefly review one model of the physiology of shock. Now this will seem odd at first, but it will make sense in a moment. We're going to start our model of shock with an electric circuit. The most basic electric circuit contains three components. A battery, which maintains what is known as an electrical potential gradient or voltage. A wire that transmits current between points of different electrical potential. And some type of resistance to the flow of current, which is called a resistor. These three components are related by something called Ohm's law, which states that the voltage between two points in a circuit is equal to the current times the total resistance between those two points. The resistance can exist as a single resistor as shown, or it can be from a combination of resistors. If I've chosen my analogy well, this should sound vaguely familiar from high school physics class or from MCAT studying. Well, the cardiovascular system acts just the same as a circuit. Instead of a battery, we have the heart. If we make the simplification of incorporating the right and left sides of the heart along with the lungs as one unit, the voltage difference is the same as the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the central venous pressure. The wires become blood vessels and the current becomes the cardiac output. And the resistors are the capillary beds in the various organs arranged in parallel. I'm showing just the brain, kidney, and muscles for simplicity. Collectively, all the resistance caused by the systemic blood vessels is called the systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. And all of these physiological parameters are associated in an extremely analogous fashion to Ohm's law. The mean arterial pressure, or MAP, minus the CVP, which is referred to as the perfusion pressure, is equal to the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. Although it doesn't get talked about much in medical school, this equation, MAP minus CVP equals cardiac output times SVR, is one of the most important equations in clinical medicine and is the key to understanding shock subtypes. We can break this equation down a little further by recognizing that the cardiac output is equal to the heart stroke volume times the heart rate. And the stroke volume is dependent upon three physiologic parameters. Preload, which is how full the left ventricle is at the end of diastole. Contractility, which is how well the left ventricle squeezes during systole. And a more complicated concept called afterload, a complete discussion of which is a little bit beyond the scope of this video. Therefore, low perfusion pressure must be due to one of the following. Low preload, low contractility, low heart rate, or low SVR. That's it. If a patient has low perfusion pressure, which usually means hypotension, they must have a derangement of one of these four parameters. And from these parameters, we get our shock subtypes. So what are those subtypes? First is hypovolemic shock. The primary physiologic derangement here is low preload, specifically low preload due to reduced intravascular volume. Common etiologies include hemorrhage from traumatic injury, GI hemorrhage, and severe diarrhea. Next is cardiogenic shock. This is shock secondary to low contractility. Common etiologies include an acute myocardial infarction or heart attack, a severe exacerbation of chronic CHF from any cause, and viral myocarditis. Then there is distributive shock, which is also occasionally referred to as vasodilatory shock. This is shock from low SVR. The main etiologies here are sepsis, anaphylaxis, and acute spinal cord trauma. When leading to shock, these are more commonly called septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and neurogenic shock, respectively. Finally, there is something called obstructive shock. This occurs when there is low preload in the left ventricle as a consequence of a physical or mechanical obstruction to venous return. For example, massive pulmonary embolism, something called pericardial tamponade, in which fluid fills the pericardial sac and prohibits diastolic filling of the ventricles, and then tension pneumothorax, in which a large amount of air becomes trapped in the pleural space of one lung, physically crowding out other intrathoracic structures. At this point, you might wonder about the low heart rate. Where does that fit in? 
Well, there are two additional distinctive forms of shock that are discussed less frequently than the others. One is arrhythmogenic shock. This is shock that occurs secondary to a cardiac arrhythmia. This can either be from a bradycardia, in which obviously the physiologic derangement is low heart rate, or it can be from a tachycardia, in which the physiologic derangement is low preload due to an excessively shortened diastolic filling time. Many people refer to these as forms of cardiogenic shock, but they are quite different from shock related to low contractility, and I personally greatly prefer the uncommonly used term arrhythmogenic shock. The other distinctive form of shock is toxin-mediated shock. For example, in cyanide poisoning, there is inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation. As a consequence, the body cannot perform aerobic respiration, it becomes systemically oxygen-starved, and switches to anaerobic respiration, resulting in severe lactic acidosis. In addition, there is also carbon monoxide poisoning, in which a leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve prevents offloading of oxygen in peripheral tissues, in addition to inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation. While arrhythmogenic and toxin-mediated shock can lead to many of the same features as the aforementioned four classically described types of shock, their presentations, and in particular their treatments, are different enough that they form their own separate category that I won't otherwise be describing in more detail in this particular video series. That's it for this video on the diagnosis and classification of shock. The next video in this series will discuss how to identify the type of shock present in a specific patient, as well as to start introducing some general treatment principles.